I'm Ayanna Contreras, and this is Vocalo Radio. I'm really excited to be here with Jamila Woods, who is a person that I've sort of like followed you since you were uh, like in high school. I swear your name has been around <laughs> here in Chicago, particularly like in the po- po- uh, spoken word poetry scene for a really long time. So to see your evolution and to see you progress um, as a uh, vocalist and also progress as an educator has been such a wonderful thing. Thank you. So welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Tell me a little bit about your path. Um, you, you're from Chicago, grew up in Chicago, um, South Side, mm-hmm. right? Um, you wound up going to Brown, which is wonderful. I love that school. But anyway, you wound up <laughs> going to Brown, and um, you came back, and you decided to like work at Young Chicago Authors. And not only that, but you decided to take your writing and sort of create like all this amazing multi-genre, multi-discipline work. Tell me about like your journey. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I grew up in a pretty, like a big family and my, my mom was very creative and always encouraged my siblings and I to be creative in whatever we were doing. And so I always, I think if I had thought I could be a singer from when I was young I probably would have set my heart on that and just like never looked back but I always just loved singing but I didn't really think of myself as like having the type of voice that could be a solo singer because I came up in my grandma's church and there were always a lot of like voices I would compare my voice to and not really think that I could measure up but just also what I learned from being in church and in other singing situations is that it's not as much about that always. It's just about like you having that passion and having like wanting to sing in the choir is what qualifies you to sing in the choir basically. Um, so at the same time, uh, I, I did like get into other, you know, ways of expression. And in high school, I got really into poetry. And through poetry was, I think, how I gained confidence in my voice and just accepting it um, and kind of owning it and really celebrating it um, through my poetry. And that kind of gave me the tools and the motivation to, you know, not really compare myself to other things anymore and just want to make things with what my voice is and, and kind of explore explore that and so I, I started singing I was singing a cappella groups in college and I was also in high school in the Chicago Children's Choir which was like pretty much my only like professional music theory training and I still like refer back to a lot of the things I learned in the Chicago Children's Choir and yeah and then I met uh, Owen Hill who I think you know um, who became my collaborator my bandmate and we started a band called m and and I think Vocalo was one of our first, probably our first radio interview. Um, and that was a really good experience. And I, I learned a lot about recording and performing. And then more recently, wanting to write music on my own has been like a whole nother step. And that's kind of where I am now. And speaking of that stuff, um, that stuff is heaven, which mm-hmm. has been really well received. Uh, it's part of like this class of music that's been coming out that's been really reflective on being black in America today, being a black woman, intersectionality, um, the community. Uh, and I know that wasn't necessarily your intent to say, I want to be part of this thing that's happening, but you were clearly responding to what's happening. Um Mm-hmm. The first song that came out, Black Girl Soldier. Mm-hmm. Tell me about like the impetus for that. Yeah, so um, that song I wrote. Um, it was it was January 2015, so almost like two years ago now, and it was really just one of those times. It was shortly after. Um, me and like Owen was moving away and I was kind of like figuring out how do I even write music by myself because we were such a unit in how we wrote um and I was feeling um I think a lot of times people don't allow themselves to process what's going on especially when it's like a lot of kind of traumatic things going on in the world and for me I think I wasn't allowing myself a lot of outlets and I had just gotten um, this email full of beats um, that my manager had sent me and I was just listening to them and then 
I all of a sudden I just kind of was giving myself little writing prompts like based off of songs that I loved and I took like the first line the first word of an Erica Badu song that I love and then it kind of just opened up this portal for me to just let out everything that I had been angry about or sad about um, from like the Boko Haram um, situation that happened with all those girls and Rakia Boyd's murder that happened in Chicago that I had just been going to a lot of kind of organizing meetings around. Um, And so it kind of just was a really cathartic thing for me that then became in a moment where I had kind of not forgotten how to make music, but was kind of like trying to figure out how to do it on my own. It it became this song that I would just, it was, it felt like a tool in my pocket that I kind of just had at very like useful moments. Like I would be at a rally or I'd just be at, you know, an open mic where people were talking about similar things. And I just, I liked the way that it was very, like, it was like the moment of writing it was very useful for me, but also having it then taught me about like, reminded me I guess like the power of of writing and you know what it's meant to do and what I mean to do with it so tell me about it the 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 sense of place on the record um Mm -hmm. it's really clearly rooted in Chicago rooted in where you are and where you're from um was that intentional and like why did you make that choice yeah I think Coming off of like four plus years of not being in Chicago, during the time of when I was in school, I think my writing would always like return to Chicago almost because I was homesick in some way or also because whenever I would be home, I would make sure to go to an open mic to make sure that like I was still speaking the same language and that I was still everything that I was writing was relevant. And I think I I also developed a really a stronger Chicago pride than even what I had before going to the East Coast because there weren't a lot of Chicago people there and it was a very different culture. Um, And I think it's it's good to go outside of where you're from so you can see it from a different perspective. Um, And also just with everything like the Chirac film or like, you know, the narratives that always have continually gone on about Chicago and continue today is like there's a there's a one story being told often. And I think being from a place, you always want to, you know, represent the multiplicity of experiences and voices that come from that place. So that's that's definitely where it came from. Probably one of my favorite songs off of Heaven is um, LSD, Mm -hmm. Um, probably because I live off of Lakeshore Drive. I work off of Lakeshore Drive. Like, my life is around Lakeshore Drive. So Mm -hmm. you're like, you love me like the lake, like, makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. And and then also uh, what I love about that song is it's got that Donnell Jones sample. Mm -hmm. And people who grew up in Chicago listening to, like, WGCI, like, I don't know if you could escape that song, that Donnell Jones song, The Where I Want to Be. That that is actually... I hadn't I hadn't ever heard that song and then in college like one of my boyfriends used that song to break up with me <gasps> like he literally played that <laughs> Did you see the video? I did. Yeah, oh he played God. the video to break up with me. And then I didn't realize that was the sample until later cuz I hadn't heard the song since then and I told Odd Couple the producer I told him the story. He was like, "Well, that's good. Like you definitely <gasps> like replay like, you know, flip that into something positive." So yeah. That was a weird fact. I don't know why I share that with you. <laughs> no, wait a minute, though. It's like, it's kind of crazy. But yeah, Donnell Jones from Chicago and definitely was a person that years ago got a lot of play. I think that song is like 15 years old. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. yeah. No, that's yeah. really interesting. Speaking of yeah. Chicago, I mean, Chicago has this rich history of, of artists that have come from here. And um, mm-hmm. it's like, what I love about what's happening right now is I feel like it's just sort of a parallel of what has happened in generations before us. Um, do you feel that? And are there people that have come out of Chicago that have like specifically inspired you? Hmm. Yeah, I definitely do. I think I want to learn more about like the those people from Chicago that I love and what was going on when they were writing. But I definitely always return to Minnie Ripperton in part just because her voice before I even knew her name was very much soundtracking a lot of my childhood and then I really love just her writing and not only like how high her voice is and how that's crazy but um, there's the Le Fleur song in particular Mm -hmm. where she's 
literally singing in gibberish slash maybe some language that I don't know for like a good portion of the song. And I think those are the kinds of artists that just I can never get them out of my head because there's some level of like illegibility or like there's layers to it that not everything is out in the open to be easily understood but there's always some context or some deeper layer that you can discover so yeah she's one of my favorites one other thing about heaven the album it's uh it's like the word heaven is really kind of literal because you're talking about people who have left and are making spaces Mm-hmm. you know, for us, like, on the other side. Mm-hmm. And so, like, there's this this supernatural conversation. Like, one song, you're literally having a conversation. Like, was that you playing with the wind? Mm-hmm. And you, right? Yeah. Like, can you talk a little bit about that? Because I, I feel like that's not something that's in a lot of contemporary music, that, that connection with the otherworldly. Oh, that's cool. I like that. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think the song lately that you're talking about, I think... Um, I always in uh, black funeral or in the church's black funerals I've been to, there's always the point where there's like this element of transcendence, like always, even in just services in general, where it's talking about, yes, there's like things going on here, but like people, they go ahead to prepare a place for us or um, just that kind of aspirational idea. Um, And I think for, for me, with my granddaddy, who the song is about, he had dementia. So he was all like it was a very slow process of kind of watching him be with us and slowly, slowly, like sometimes be like f- like I have a poem where I said he's like w- half in this world and half out. And I think a lot of those poems are what I went back to to write the the songs lately and also breadcrumbs. And I think it it's kind of, I guess, a way of saying on the one hand, I believe that, like, I I believe that he is doing that and also that I don't have to wait to still talk to him or to still try to create some sense of heaven here at the same time. So it was kind of like, kind of, to me, trying to unpack this notion of heaven, which I've been, you know, kind of taught to understand it from a very, very young age. So I'm kind of true through the project trying to unpack that and kind of own it and reclaim it. Yeah. Now I'm going to go deep on you. <laughs> so there's this pastor who used to be in Tulsa, Oklahoma, um, and he uh, decided that heaven was not a place somewhere far away, that heaven and hell are both here. Mm-hmm. So he was determined to be a heretic, and he moved to Chicago, right? So, ha-ha! Mm-hmm. But, but right, well, what are your thoughts about that? I mean, like, have you gotten to the point where you're sort of re evaluating some of those um, spiritual truths that were kind of ingrained in you as a young person. Oh, yeah. I I feel like I went to my grandma's church. It was a Baptist church growing up um, pretty very regularly. But then my mom would pick me up from church and we would like unpack every single thing because my mom was always very much like she taught me that I had my own guardian angel. She taught she practiced Reiki and like was a very like alternative medicine healer, did meditation and things like that. And so I always had this duality in my mind and it never felt to me like I had to choose one. And my they just kind of would mix together and I would invent in my mind ways for like, yeah, Jesus meditates and yeah, like everyone does Reiki. Like, you know, like it's like it became in my kid mind like very easy to put those things together. Um, so yeah, I, I, I love that idea of of you know what the what that pastor is saying and I also you know I have some close friends who are Jewish and who like just hearing them talk about like how the idea of hell doesn't exist at the same time is like also a really cool idea to me so I don't I through I think through my poems and songs like I ask more questions and I try to nail down answers but I think that's very useful in in the world that we live in where we're we're always kind of taught to search for like what's the right answer like what what are you going to figure out like what's your theory and like i think um art is a good way of like opening freeing your mind up from having to do those kinds of things sometimes and you can kind of make things more complicated as opposed to trying to figure it out 
Right. And it's interesting because as you're trying to figure out, you're helping other people mm. figure it out, too, along the way. And people you don't even know, it's just kind of creepy. But it's, <laughs> it's cool, too. Yeah. That's a beautiful thing. Okay, so now I got a question for you. Um, you're connected to the Beverly community, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. So Beverly, for folks who aren't really that familiar with the geography of Chicago, Beverly is, like, literally across the street from, like, Mount Greenwood. Mm-hmm. And Mount Greenwood right now... Terrifying. It, yeah, well, it's been terrifying for a while, <laughs> yeah. but it's been in the news um, because there was right there was a shooting of a of a black man coming from a funeral, mm-hmm. which is interesting. That's We're talking really about cute. otherworldly stuff, and um, uh, he wound up kind of yeah. The the family was trying to gather together, and there were some pro- protesters who had come mainly to comfort, and there was another protest of community members white community members from Mount Greenwood who came and confronted these other people. And there's just been like just a series of of really sad events mm-hmm. around that. So as an artist, though, you know, as a writer, as a, as a vocalist, as a songwriter, like what what is your response to things like this that are happening? Not maybe not just in Mount Greenwood, but just right now, this this climate, because your album came out really there was a lot happening, but some of this specifically political um, negativity hadn't erupted on the level that it is right now. Like, what are what's percolating up there? I think to me, there's a really um, like there's like just a sense of wanting to understand because I think that is what I try to do through writing about something. Sometimes is to try to understand it, and so because it does feel like I guess that's why that was fascinating that conversation in that video is because it was a conversation like they weren't screaming at each other they were having a conversation and I think that I would I am interested in understanding like what is going through those people's minds when they're protesting Blue Lives Matter because like even a couple I've written like a lot of poems I think because I'm trying to like process like my childhood in Beverly and like things that happened that were actually really messed up that in the moment I didn't realize I wouldn't categorize them as racism but like I I think it to me like it just makes me want to I think art can be a way of having empathy towards people that you know it's very difficult to do um, especially when the stakes are so high as they are and so I think that's kind of where my mind is at like how can I like garner some sense of like that that urge to understand because I think that's the only way that that I can kind of productively move forward to be in a creative space because yeah and to make any kind of art that's nuanced you know which I think is important. This is Jamila Woods. Um, I'm Ayana Contreras. I just want to thank you so much Jamila for joining me and like talking to me about these things. I, I think a lot of people have been really listening to your music as a form of like you know, catharsis and just to kind of hear where your head is at, I think is going to be valuable for folks out there. Thank you for having me. It was really great questions. Rosa was a freedom fighter and she thought I sat by.